accepted. What is up? What is up, my hacker friends? Today, we are going to talk about XXE injection or XML external entity injection. Now, before we get into the whole injection stuff, we first need to learn exactly what is XML. Well, XML is a software and hardware independent tool for storing and transporting data. It stands for extensible markup language, and it's pretty similar to HTML. It was designed to store and transport data and is also designed to be self-descriptive, unlike HTML. So with XML, the author must define both the tags and the document structure. Would you like to get a free copy of my brand new, never before seen Python 3 ethical hacking course on cyber surveillance tools? In this course, I have over four hours of content where I show you how to monitor all keystrokes, how to capture clipboard data, how to record the microphone, and how to log all monitor screenshots in both Windows and Linux using Python 3. If you want to get a free copy of this course, go ahead and leave a comment saying that you would like a copy, and I'll select 10 random people from the comments to get a free copy of my brand new course. So why would we use XML? Well, XML basically simplifies data sharing, data transport, platform changes, and data availability. It stores data in plain text format, which provides a software and hardware independent method of storing, transporting, and basically sharing data. So for example, if you had two pieces of software that were developed by completely different companies, XML could be a tool that you could use to facilitate the transfer of information from both systems. So that's where XML can be useful in one example. So what exactly does XML look like? Well, here we have a sample piece of XML code, shall we call it, and it's basically comprised of elements. The first element we have is the message element. And within that message element, we have other elements. We have a to element, a from element, a subject element, and a body element. Now, I kind of like to think of this as like if you were designing a table in a database. So if, you were, if we were gonna do this in a database, we'd create a table called message. And then within inside that table, we'd probably define some fields called to, from, subject, and body. Now, of course, we'd probably have other ones like date and red and not red and so on and so forth. But this is just give you an example of how XML basically structures the data within the file. So that's how I kind of like to look at it. It's kind of like defining a database table, but not quite exactly. So something else we need to talk about is DTD. So what exactly is DTD? Well, DTD is the document type definition. And now this defines the structure and the legal elements and attributes of an XML document. So with DTD, groups of people or developers can agree on what the XML file should look like. And this will help facilitate data structure for interchanging data. An application can use this DDT to verify that the XML data is in the proper format. Um, a DTD file can be either defined internally within the XML document or externally from an external file from a URI or a URL. And again, this just helps the developer to look at the XML file and read it and say, hey, is this in the proper format it's supposed to be in? Okay, so now let's take a look at what exactly does it look like to define a DTD internally inside an XML file. Well, here we have a DTD comprised right here. And you can see we have the doc type message. This is the root element of the document, which is message, which we have right here. Next, we have the message element, and it specifies what elements are contained within that element of message, which is to, from, subject, and body, as we see here. 
And then we have each element itself, the to element, the from element, subject element, and body element. And you can see they're each defined with this PC data. Now, what is PC data? That stands for parse character data. We're basically saying text data. So again, I like to think of this as defining a table in a database. I mean, it's not, it's not exactly what we're doing, but in an essence, that's kind of what we're doing. We're defining the structure of our data within our XML. So then a programmer can then read this DTD and then understand if the structure of the data is correct. For example, if it was messing the two element well hey we know we're messing some data here there should be a two element and we can say maybe this file is corrupt and we can look into that further but that's basically what the dtd does it just lays out how the data should be structured so now what does it look like if we were to define an external dtd so here we have an external dtd definition and simply we just use the doc type message with the keyword called system followed by the URI or URL. This right here could either be a local resource or it could be a URL to a resource on some server somewhere else. But the DTD is defined within this message.dtd file. And the use of this system keyword is going to be very useful to us later because it allows the inclusion of an external file into the XML document. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now we're gonna start talking about DTD entities, and this is where we're gonna start getting into how we can inject with XML. So an entity is a mechanism to define replacement values where an entity name is declared. And when that name is referenced, the entity value is read in its place. I like to think of entities as kind of like coding variables when you're programming. Um, you know, for example, you might declare a variable as um, name, and then you might give that variable the uh, value of Bob. So it's kind of like what entities are. You're kind of like creating variables within a XML document. And an entity can be declared either internally or externally from a URI or URL as well. So let's take a look at an internal entity. So here we have an internal entity. So you can see it's deprived by first this entity keyword followed by the entity name. And if we were writing code, this would be the variable name. And then next we have the value of that entity. Or if we were writing code, this would be the value you're supplying to your variable. So here's an example that you could use. So we have the first entity named email and the value is sum at email.com. The next one is defined as author and inside there, there's something a little tricky here. We have the text hack happy followed by at email semicolon. And that's how you reference an entity. It's always begins with the at sign or excuse me, the and sign, the name of the entity followed by a semicolon. So basically what we're doing is we're taking this entity, embedding it here within the second entity, and then we reference the author entity from the author message. So we're gonna then end up with the following result. So when this entity is read through the XML parser, it's going to display hack happy sum at email.com. So let's take a look at an external entity. So it's very similar, except this time we do entity name followed by the system keyword and then the URI or URL to the external entity. Now, we're gonna use an example of the same thing, but we have in this example, a entity DTD located at example.com. And here we have the same example. We reference the author entity within the author message and we get the following result, author hack happy at sum at email.com. Okay, so now let's take a look at actually how some web code would process an XML file. 
So here we have some code that is attempting to log in to a web application, or basically it's posting to a login form with user credentials. So let's go ahead and dissect this code real quick. So at the top, we're creating our XML request or our XML document. And within the XML document, we have a login element followed by two additional elements, user for the username and pass for the password. Now below that, we're using curl to post this XML document to the login form at the following location. So basically we're just making a request, a post request to this form, which contains our XML document. So once that's all set up, we'll go ahead and send that request right here. The results of that will then be stored in data. And down here, we use an if statement, if statement to check for any errors. If we find an error, we'll just simply print that to the screen. Otherwise, we'll simply post what the login form responded with. And then finally, we'll close curl. So what's gonna happen is this source is going to send a request to the server that has the following code on the other side. So this is the login.php form or rather code. So let's go ahead and look at this. So basically this code is set up to allow external entities. Once that's done, it's basically going to get the posted XML. So that's going to be this document right here. Once it has that, it's going to store it in the XM variable. Then to process or parse the XML, we need to create a um, XML class. From there, we're gonna load in the XML document. And once that's loaded in, we're then going to basically parse that XML and store the results into the login variable. Now, once we've done that, we can then access the elements within the XML document. So first, we're going to store the username stored from the user element which is hack happy into the user variable and then the password, which is password into the pass variable. And then finally, all this code is going to do is just simply echo to the screen. You have logged in as user and whatever user name was supplied. So this is the code that we're going to be using to do our proof of concept. So now that we got that out of the way, why don't we go ahead and jump into a live system and test this out in the real world. Okay, now we're on our Linux system and now we can test out our XXE injection. So you can see here, I have the code that we just reviewed. Here's the post script and here's the login script. Now let's go ahead and just run this as is so you can see the results. So I'm gonna go to localhost sin.php and as expected, the response from the login script was you have logged in as user at Cappy because that's the text that was in the um, user element. So let's go back to our code and now let's do an XXE injection. So first thing we need to do is define our DTD. And now that we have that, we can now define an entity. We're going to use the system keyword and now we're going to use a local resource to store inside our entity. And let's try Etsy password. So we all know we want the password file. All right, so basically what this is saying is we're gonna find an external entity named own. Using the system keyword, we're going to store the Etsy password file contents in the own entity. So now in order to read and actually get the input from the password, we then need to reference that entity in the user variable because that's what the login page displays. And remember to access or use an entity, you use the and followed by the entity name and a semicolon. So we're gonna go ahead and save this. And if we did everything right, when we refresh and send this new XML request, we should be able to inject the Etsy password file into that external entity and then have it display on the screen. So let's see if it's successful. 
boom, there you go. So as you can see, we were able to perform an XXE injection and force the web server to display the contents of the Etsy password file. So at this point, you can just sit and read any files that the web server has access to. And that's the basics of how you execute an XXE injection. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how you can easily prevent this XXE injection. So if you wanted to protect your code, all you need to do is come to this first uh, line of code and change this to true to disable external entities. So let's go ahead and make that change. Save that. Let's go back to our web browser. Let's just go ahead and click refresh on that same request. And this time it should not load the hosts file. So when I click refresh, as you can see, it says you have logged in as user and it does not display anything for the username because we prevented it from loading that external entity. So that's a very simple way that you can prevent an external entity from being injected within your code. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you have not subscribed, go ahead, click that subscribe button and tap that bell. And remember, I will see you on the other side.